All right, kiddos, this is your earmuffs warning. This is not an over-the-top raunchy podcast, but I'm not afraid to use a little colorful language, as evidenced by the title of my books. So we may cover some adult topics as well, if those come up in the questions. If these are sensitive things for you, feel free to check out another podcast. It's no problem. And I also need to give the disclaimer that while I am a therapist, I'm not your therapist. Please do not use this podcast as a substitute for getting professional help. And also, please don't try to sue me. Thanks. All right. What's up, ladies, gentlemen, friends of all varieties? This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, and this is uh, episode two. Thank you for joining me again. Uh, This is a weekly show where I answer your questions about life, relationships, self-help, psychology, school, whatever, and uh, really happy to be here. I have a few really great listener questions today, Uh, but before we get into those, I want to give just a couple announcements. So if you're thinking to yourself, Robert, I really, really, really just love your voice, and I'd love to hear more of you podcasting, how can I do that? (laughs) <laughs> There's a few ways that you can do that uh, right now. So last week I was on the Dead Inside show, which is a podcast about AMC's The Walking Dead. Um, so this was last week's episode, the uh, one called Same Boat, I think. And I was on the podcast as a guest host with my buddy Dylan. And it was a really great episode. So if you want to hear me kind of dive deep into the character development, identity development, psyche of the characters in The Walking Dead... That's a show that you would want to check out. Again, that was last week's episode, so if you're already caught up, then you probably don't care too much. But, you know, it could be interesting to you. I had a really good time. Um, Also, this week, I will be on a show called Smart Passive Income by Pat Flynn. Now, you might have heard of this before. It's a very, very, very popular podcast. It's one of the top business podcasts in the world, and Pat Flynn is uh, pretty well known, I think. And the show is all about uh, passive income, which means, you know, you do the work up front, then you sit back and reap the benefits later. So I go on the show to talk about my experience writing my books, um, doing the ebook, audiobook, print book process. And I talk about, you know, tips that I have and how the passive income from those things has really helped me uh, be more selective and focused in my clinical work. So it's really cool. If it's something that interests you, uh, definitely check it out. Uh, again, that's a smart passive income podcast, and I'll be on there this week. And then, of course, there's a Dead Inside show. And um, I'm also working on the audiobook right now for my second book, Hardcore Self Help Fuck Depression. Uh, about th- four, four chapters in, I think, out of 10. So, you know, it's an ongoing process. I'm getting bit by bit done. The chapters are about 30 minutes long when read out loud. So, I have to have some time that I could set aside and do that without my kid crying and stuff like that. So it'll be a little bit before that's released, but I'm trying to knock it out as best I can. Um, As always, the first book, um, Fuck Anxiety, is available on Audible, and I encourage you to check that out if you like me talking to you directly into your ear holes. I think that the books are best, you know, heard instead of written because I wrote them in my voice. So I heard myself speaking it out loud as I wrote it. So the audiobook really gives me a chance to translate that into the way that I would expect it to be heard. So anyways, all of that is, uh, all those are my announcements and uh, let's get into some of the questions. Okay, so question one is an email question. If you guys have questions for me that you'd like me to answer, please, please tweet them at me at Duff the Psych on Twitter, or you can send them to me via email if they're longer than that or you want to stay anonymous for any reason, uh, my email address is duffthepsych at gmail.com. So this is an email question, and the person did not indicate whether I could share their name or not, so I'll keep them anonymous. But it was a female, I'll share that. And she writes, Hey, so my dad was an angry man to say the least. Sometimes I notice I have his short temper and turn to punching things like walls, doors, pillows, etc. out of rage. He did this constantly when I was a child, multiple holes in the doors and walls. How can I steer away from a hot temper? So it's a, it's a really good question and actually a very um, relevant question because I have um, some people in therapy right now that I'm seeing for similar issues that are dealing with explosive anger. Um, one thing that I, I definitely want to point out is that it you're not going crazy. It does follow in families, whether that's you know nature or nurture. 
it just tends to show that people who have anger problems typically have a parent who also had anger problems. I don't see it as often in females, um, just by my own observation, but certainly in males, I've seen it quite a bit in my practice where, um, you know, somebody comes in, usually a younger male has problems with anger, just like you described that kind of explosive anger, yelling, punching things. And they're almost an exact copy of what their father was like. So I, I definitely feel you there. Um, you're not going crazy. It definitely does kind of trickle down in the family. Um, but there's a lot that you can do about it. Um, it's not anywhere close to a hopeless sort of condition. And it's not just the way that you are, the way that you're going to be forever. Now, it's important to think of anger as um, kind of reaching a threshold. So the way I see anger is, and especially, you know, explosive anger where you act out, do something stupid, punch something, say something that you regret, that sort of thing. Explosive anger is a failure to address it early enough. Right. So if you think of a, a meter, like a thermometer, and, you know, when you get up towards the if you think of the old school thermometers, like the mercury ones where the level rises and rises and rises as it gets hotter and then up towards the top, it's like red saying like warning. Once you get past up 100 degrees, you know, you're in the fever territory. So, you know, you don't want the meter to get that high. So I want you to kind of think of anger that way. And everybody has a certain threshold, right, a certain level that they can get up to before they reach that breaking point, that point where they do something stupid, where they hurt someone, etc. And everybody has a different threshold. Sometimes people have very, very high thresholds, and it takes a lot to get, to get them to that point. They're very chill, very calm. Some people have a very low threshold where, you know, if somebody gets their order wrong at Starbucks and they're about ready to snap. So it's important to think about where your threshold is, um, just to kind of be aware. Is yours very low? Is it very high? And then kind of take that into account with what's going on in your life. Even if you have a pretty high threshold, if you have an overabundance of things that are annoying, that are difficult, that are stressful in your life, you're already going to be pushing up against that threshold. So it only takes another inch or two to get you over that hump and into the territory of exploding. Um, but like I said, I think of explosive anger as more of a failure to address it earlier on. And so the task for you, I think, is to start paying attention to it, start being aware of your patterns and catching them before it gets to that point. One really good way to do that is to start journaling, so to write things down. And you can do this on paper, you can do this in audio format, you can do this with bullet points on your phone, whatever way that you would like, but to notice the things that lead up to angry outbursts for you. Because they're not all created equal, it's not all the same thing, and it's important to pay attention to what yours looks like. Uh, one thing that's been very helpful for people that I've worked with is to look at what's called, or what I call, I don't think anybody else calls it this, but your anger timeline. So what happens in you when you're becoming angry? Oftentimes you're looking at physical things, right? What happens first in your body? Where do you notice it in your body first when you're getting angry? And the way to do this is pretty easy. I, I think that most of the people who are very very much struggling with anger in their life can put themselves in that mental space and sort of start to feel what it feels like without actually being in the situation. So if you imagine a situation that really pissed you off recently, something that made you go over the top and punch a wall or something like that, um, what you can do is you can think about that, really put yourself in that mental space and then start to notice the first changes that are happening in your body. So for some people, they notice, you know, their muscles, they notice that their hands are clenched, they notice that they're posturing differently. They notice that um, there's some muscular changes going on in their body. For other people, they notice their faces get flushed or their head feels hot. Uh, maybe they're breathing more heavily. Maybe they're not breathing at all. Maybe they're tensing up and holding their breath. So what I would encourage you to do is kind of um, think about and actually write out your anger timeline. Also notice whether it's the thought that comes first or the feeling that comes first. When you're feeling tense, when you're feeling like you're posturing for anger, when all those things that I described are happening, are you already thinking about the fact that you're angry or does all that happen before the thought even crosses your mind? And then by the time you actually notice that you're angry in your mind, it's too late. So I want you to think about those sorts of things. Like I said, actually write it down on paper or you know type it out, whatever you want so that you can kind of externalize it, which is really helpful in moving forward from that.
Once you do that, you can kind of start to acknowledge and notice the process playing out before it gets to that point, right? So instead of um, realizing it once it's too late, once you're already pissed as hell and you're about to punch somebody in the face or break your wall or throw your cat or whatever, um, you can notice, oh, my hands are clenched right now. I guess that means I'm probably starting to get angry. So you can do some things to try to counteract that. You can make the preparations and things like that before it gets past that threshold. And coping skills will be different for everybody. Um, some things that, that tend to help are, um, you know, deep breathing. So if you are practiced in deep breathing, you can certainly use that as a coping skill. Um, something like getting out of the situation, right? So if it's happening when you're in an argument with somebody else, like a significant other or family member, noticing that you're angry, kind of making a statement that I'm starting to get to my threshold and I need to remove myself from the situation. We can do this later and actually going outside, getting some fresh air. I had one patient of mine who the answer for him was just opening the door, right? So opening the front door because he would yell uh, very angrily at his wife and get very aggressive when he was angry. Um, other than that, he was a very calm guy, but if there was anybody around, he would never act like that. So when he would notice himself starting to get angry, he just opened the front door so that his connection to the outside world was present. And that would kind of kick him into gear of going, oh, I can't act like this. So, you know, whatever your coping skills are, whether it's physiological, calming yourself down with breathing or something more um, social, like removing yourself from the situation, bringing someone else into the fold, whatever the case may be, you're going to be able to use those a lot better if you learn the signs of your buildup before you get there. Another thing that you can do is to um, write down the situations and your thoughts that tend to lead to anger. This is a CBT approach, so cognitive behavioral therapy, and I talk about these in my books, how to do a thought log, which is basically where you write down the event that happened, you write down what your emotional consequence was, so what happened, in, in your case it's going to be blew up, got angry, you know, acted out in XYZ sort of way. And then you fill in the middle part, which is the beliefs, so your thoughts that fueled that behavior. So basically, uh, an example might be, so um, my partner didn't text me back, right? So they didn't text you back, and so you got really angry and punched something. Now, the belief that was driving that, the thoughts that were driving that, were that they were doing something else, they didn't care about you, um, they're too busy to text you back, you don't matter so much whatever sort of thoughts actually fueled that anger. And by doing that, you can start to break down the relationship between your thoughts and your behaviors and notice kind of what situations drive what thoughts drive what behaviors and kind of really break down that link, you know, and then you could start challenging it. What's the evidence of these beliefs being true? Maybe my partner was actually driving or maybe they were busy with something else that was legitimate and that's why they didn't text me back. You know, so putting some intermediate steps between you and that anger. And then overall, finally, I just want you to think of anger um, kind of as a symptom, right? Um, just like you don't want to use medication to dull away pain without actually addressing the underlying cause, without actually figuring out where that pain is coming from, you would want to do the same thing with anger. You don't want to just find all these coping skills, things to numb out that anger, things to uh, push it away. You want to also look into where that anger is coming from in the first place, which is something that may take a bit of introspection, may take a bit of therapy, may take a bit of, you know, writing down those thoughts and those behaviors, like I said, to connect those dots. But, you know, anger doesn't just come out of nowhere. So look at those uh, processes that have led up to it, kind of try to get some insight into where it's come from and address those things as well. So it's not as big of a problem for you. Okay, so really great question. I appreciate that one. I think that that's a question a lot of people can probably um, identify with. So really glad I got the chance to answer that one. Okay, so question two is another email one. And this is from Nate. He said I could use his first name. And it's a little bit long, so let me read through it here. I might gloss over some stuff. Um, main issue, I don't feel like I've ever learned to cope with death, love, trust, etc. Um, I've lost nearly everyone close to me, including most of my family. With every death or with every instance of being hurt, I feel like I've added a little wall and another layer on top. I'm now at the point that I'm buried in this figurative bunker with a pillow over my head, unable to cope with the smallest of life's details. 
I quit my job about four months ago because I literally couldn't bring myself to get out of bed anymore. Subsequently, now that I'm without insurance, I can't get the help that I should be seeking for myself. I've been on meds for almost my entire life, trying to get the anxiety and depression under control, but they no longer work, and I know that I need some counseling along with a medication adjustment. I've looked into sliding scale clinics, because I have no money, and other public services, but they all require Medicaid, which I apparently don't qualify for in my state. So I guess my question is, got any other ideas? I almost lost this battle once, and I'm genuinely fighting for my life. I feel like I'm running out of options. So this is a bit of a heavier question, right? Um, I really appreciate you writing in, Nate, um, because you're at the you know moderate to severe end of the spectrum with with this depression, and you're really in the um, the cognitive funk of depression where everything feels like it's not worth it, everything feels like it's not going to make a difference because it feels like you've tried everything already and you've learned that nothing makes a difference. Um, I write about a lot of this stuff in my book, um, Fuck Depression, which if you've picked up already, definitely look over again. If you haven't, if you can't afford it right now, please send me an email. I'd love to give you a free copy if, if that's something that you think would help you out and you don't have the means to get it right now. Um, so just email me back if that's an issue and I'll, I'll just send you a copy because I think you could get a lot out of it. Um, but hopelessness is a symptom of depression. It's a trick that your mind plays on you to say that it's not worth it, that you can't make any difference, that this is it, it's it's not going to get any better. Um, and that goes away when the depression resolves. So uh, I appreciate you reaching out because you're still in this. You're still fighting for it. You still care enough to write a big, long email to somebody on the internet. Uh, you're looking for options. So all of that is really great. That's a good sign. Stick with that. Um, I probably don't need to say it, but if it gets to the point where you're not feeling safe, make sure you call your local, you know, um, suicide hotline or um, 911, any emergency service. You know, when you're talking about the permanent destruction of your body, that's a permanent solution to this temporary issue. I know you've been dealing with it for a long time, but please keep yourself safe. All of that said, let's actually kind of break down the question a bit and get into it. So, it's a serious concern that you're talking about, that you don't have insurance, that you don't have any way to seek help. Um, you've done a lot of things right. It looks like you've tried medication before, um, that you've tried other things to get your depression and anxiety under control. But right now you're kind of in a bind. So you quit your job, which means that you don't have the benefits there. Um, and you don't have insurance, which means that it's, it's hard to get treatment. So you've looked into some sliding scale clinics. Um, you can probably find something. Now, one thing to look into maybe if you're not on the right track with the whole Medicaid thing is maybe look into what are called free clinics instead of just sliding scale. So um, you can just do a Google search. I don't want to give you a particular URL, but just do a Google search for free clinics. And even better if you put in your like zip code or your state free clinics in you know whatever zip code or whatever city, whatever state and they should bring up some options for you. Free clinics are places where you can get very, very cheap or free care, um, and it's basically for low-income people, and the care that you're gonna get there isn't going to be the you know top-of-the-line care. There's certainly going to be great clinicians there, um, but it's not going to be the same care that you would get if you were paying, you know, tons of money out of pocket. You know, you're not going to be going to UCLA and getting the top of the line care or something like that. But it, it's there for you, and I want you to think of it basically as a bridge while you're trying to get through this. Usually they have physical uh, help, like um, general practitioners and things like that. And they also have therapists and psychiatrists. So you just got to do a little bit of digging. I know you're probably running out of energy to keep digging and looking for things, but just push a little bit harder, look up free clinics in your area, and, and they might be able to help out. Another thing that might help out, so say you go to a psychiatrist for very cheap, they give you an adjustment to your medication that they think is going to work, but then you have to pay for that medication somehow. Um, there's a really, really awesome resource that a lot of people don't know about, which is uh, medication coupons. Uh, my wife is on a couple of medications, um, you know, psychiatric medications, and they're really, really expensive at full price. And even with um, you know our insurance coverage, they're pretty expensive. And what we've learned is that we can use medication coupons online to get a better deal than we would even through our insurance. Um, the way to find these is just look up the medication name. So for instance, um, hydroxazine and coupon, and it should pull up uh, websites like GoodRx or um, 
I forget what the other URLs are, but all you do is you use their search tool. So you put in the medication, you put in the dosage, you put in the amount of the pills that your prescription is written for, and it will give you local places that you can use that coupon at. So it'll say Walmart or you know Walgreens or whatever, and you can bring in that coupon and they will put in the code. And it's basically a manufacturer coupon to reduce the price of your medication. It's surprising, but it works really well. I mean, I'm talking, instead of paying a few hundred bucks for medications for my wife, we pay like uh, 45 bucks total for two medications for a really big prescription. Um, so it can reduce it quite a bit. So that's one thing to look at if you're having trouble you know, making ends meet and paying for that medication. Another resource you might think about is, is groups and things like that. Um, there's probably a lot of local groups for people that are trying to cope with similar things, be it anxiety, depression, loss, etc. And if you don't want to go to in-person groups, you might think about looking for online stuff. There are places like um, Reddit, which have groups of people. Um, sometimes those are hit and miss. Sometimes the people there like to wallow a little more than help each other out. Um, but there are other communities online as well. Um, and again, Google is your best friend there looking for online support groups, but they do exist. There's also internet-based therapy these days, and um, there's a lot of different types. If you just, again, Google. I know I'm telling you to use the almighty Google a lot, but I don't want to give you direct resources because I want you to find them for yourself. And also, there's so many different options out there. Um, but research says that internet-based therapy is about as effective as in-person therapy. And often it's cheaper these days. So if you can find a place to do some internet therapy, that might help you bridge the gap right now where you feel like you can't exactly get out of the house. So um, that could be another resource as well. I know I'm throwing a lot out there, but so far we've talked about free clinics, we've talked about medication coupons, we've talked about online support groups, we've talked about online therapy. Those are all things that you're not doing right now, I think, that could potentially help out. Like I said, if you need a free copy of my book, hit me up and then look for other books as well. They have workbooks, they have self-help books, all sorts of things that are related to your situation. Like I said, I know you're still in this and you're still fighting it, so let's hold on to that spark and amplify it a bit. I think that um, you might be able to use a little bit of that five-minute rule, which is something that I write about in my book as well. You can handle just about anything for five minutes, be it searching for a new coping tool online, be it calling a clinic, be it going on a walk, you know, whatever the case may be. Give it five minutes of trying, and then if you have to quit after that, that's okay, but at least give it five minutes. And what you'll find that what you'll find is often after five minutes, you just want to continue and you can keep that ball rolling. All right, Nate, so I hope that some of those comments were helpful for you. I know that's not going to solve your entire situation, but those are some thoughts that I have. Um, keep fighting the good fight, and if you want to check in with us again, feel free to write back with progress or with other questions related to what you would ask today. Okay, last question for today is a little bit of a quicker one, and this is from Conrad on Twitter. And he asks, is it possible that quitting smoking can trigger depression months later? Any tips for managing it without returning to cigarettes? Um, so that's a good question as well. Yeah, it, it's interesting. You know, I would say that it's possible that it can trigger depression, but probably not physiologically. Um, it's unlikely that you're having some sort of, you know, physiological withdrawal or something like that. It's going to be more in the psychological realm. One thing that I think could be happening is that um, maybe you're encountering some situations that prior to quitting cigarettes, you had previously dealt with by using cigarettes. So as a coping skill, you know, a lot of people use cigarettes to deal with stress, which is actually a pretty poor idea because physiologically it doesn't really help you out any in like the stress anxiety department but you know they have this association where they are stressed out they go outside they get some air they have a smoke you can do all of those things without having a smoke right you can stop go outside get some fresh air take a break and not have the cigarette um, so like i said i think you're probably going through something that you would normally cope with using cigarettes so instead maybe there's some substitute behaviors that we can use uh, one of them, which is pretty funny, and I got this idea from uh, Jane McGonigal, who wrote uh, Super Better, um, but she makes a suggestion for people um, quitting cigarettes, and it's actually research-supported, to play Candy Crush 
or play any sort of puzzle game. So Tetris, Bejeweled, Candy Crush, any sort of match three or visual puzzle game. And the reason for that is that cravings, like cravings for cigarettes or cravings for a drug, are very visual. Oftentimes when you get a craving, you see yourself going through the process of engaging in that. You see yourself, you know, getting out the pack, pulling out a cigarette, getting that fresh air, you know, lighting it up, all that stuff, taking your first drag. And it's a very visual sort of phenomenon. Um, so what this does using a puzzle game is it overrides your visual working memory. And what that means is it overrides that part of your brain that temporarily holds visual information because your brain is occupied with that puzzle. You're trying to figure it out. And research shows that even after you're done playing the game, so say you play the game for 10 minutes, your brain is still kind of working out that puzzle. I don't know if you guys have ever had the, the feeling of, you know, you play Tetris for like 20 minutes straight, and then once you look away, the rest of the world kind of looks like it's dissolving into Tetris blocks. Or I used to get that feeling a lot when I played Dance Dance Revolution as a kid, the arcade game. After I play for a long time, I see the arrows everywhere. You know, so these sorts of things, like I said, they override your visual working memory. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to visualize yourself doing that, uh, going through the process, you know, getting out your cigarettes and so on. But it's going to help you reduce the intensity of that craving, hopefully enough to make a different choice. So that's kind of a substitute behavior along the lines of, you know, instead of using a cigarette, if you're feeling orally, like you need stimulation using a lollipop or gum or chewing on a toothpick or whatever the case may be. And those are sort of temporary coping solutions. And just like the answer for the um, anger that we talked about earlier, it's important to look at the underlying cause. So kind of look at the antecedents, the things that come before this feeling um, and try to understand what's driving it. So what's happening that's making you want to have a cigarette and break down the situations that are sort of leading to depression. And instead of just thinking about the cigarettes, think about how you can address those underlying concerns a bit. And again, a lot of this echoes the thing with the anger. So I won't go into all of that again, but hopefully that little tip was helpful for you and a really, really good question. Okay, guys, that's about it for the show. I really appreciate you joining me for this uh, second episode. Hope it wasn't uh, too boring for you. I think that there are some really good tidbits in there. Um, if you want me to be covering other sorts of material, please write in with your questions and let me know what I should be covering. Uh, as always, you can tweet me at DuffThePsych. You can email me, DuffThePsych at gmail.com. Give me your questions. Let me know whether you want me to share your name or whether you want to stay anonymous. Um, I have a guest coming up on a podcast soon, a buddy of mine who wrote some really beautiful things on his blog about depression, and I'm going to be interviewing him about his experiences with depression, overcoming it, sliding back into it, stuff like that. So look forward to that. And I wanted to end today with a quote from my book that I thought was pretty relevant related to the things that we were talking about. Okay, this quote is about um, emotional bankruptcy, which is a method that I talk about in the chapter of my book called On Letting Go. And this is from the Fuck Depression book. Um, and in here I talk about the technique of declaring emotional bankruptcy, which means kind of cutting your losses and allowing yourself to move forward with your life. Even though you've built up a lot of baggage in the past, you've done a lot of things wrong, things haven't gone your way, and it's hard to let that go. But if you don't let that go, there's no way you're going to move forward. So uh, here's the quote. We're trying to move forward, and the fact that we haven't been able to move forward until this point is the very thing keeping us feeling guilty and preventing us from moving forward at all. If this applies to you, I want you to consider declaring emotional bankruptcy. You can't ever deny all of the things that have led you to this point, but it's absolutely certain that you won't be able to improve if they're constantly overwhelming you. I hereby absolve you of your emotional debt. You don't have to find a way to mentally reconcile every single action or inaction. I know you try as if there were some way to think about it long enough to figure out a way to feel less shitty about it. Or you might be the type to just replay scenarios in your head over and over as a sort of self-flagellation, because in your mind, you deserve exactly what has happened. I call bullshit. The past is not the present. Yes, it has influenced what you're going through, but if you let it stay in the past, it will stop hurting you so badly in the present. All right, guys, thanks again, and I'll see you next week.